on World News Tonight. Pele forever. Pele, the football legend who reformed the game into what it is today, has passed away at the ripe age of 82. More convictions. Myanmar court finds former Burmese head Suchi guilty on all counts of corruption in the latest of the government's suppression of the former government. Allies converse. Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping meet via video conference to discuss the future of the two nations' defense programs. And New Year's prep. The dawning of the new year is just around the corner as nations ready themselves for the big night. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you are joining us on the last bulletin of World News Tonight for the year 2022. Now when Diego Maradona died in 2020, Pele said that he someday hopes to play ball with Maradona in the sky. Today, sadly, is that day. Football legend, Brazilian hero and the only player to win the World Cup three times, Edson Arantes do Nascimento, better known as Pele, has died aged 82 after battling an intense fight with cancer of the colon. Big names in the football world such as Lionel Messi, Neymar Jr., David Beckham and also outside the sport such as Barack Obama, Lewis Hamilton and Sylvester Stallone had paid their tribute on social media showing respect for the trajectory of Pele's life and how they revolutionized football into the sport that we love today. His goals, more than a thousand, legendary. His records, three World Cups, unmatched. And his name, known around the world, Pele. Born into poverty in the favelas of Brazil in 1940, Edson Arantes do Nascimento started out kicking around socks and grapefruits before dominating the schoolyard, where he picked up the nickname Pele. In 1958, at just 17, he burst onto the world stage, becoming the youngest player to score a goal in a FIFA World Cup match and two more in the finals. Brazil went on to win the cup, its first ever. Pele would again lift the trophy in 1962 and 1970. The major European football clubs tried to recruit him, but he stayed loyal 19 years with his Brazilian team, Santos. Few Americans at the time knew any professional soccer players, but everyone knew Pele. Thrilled when he signed with the New York Cosmos in 1975 before retiring. You know, I feel very, very, very sorry because I love soccer. And uh, it's uh, like a uh, part of my life I, I lost. Off the field, Pele became one of the most well-known celebrities on the planet. A pitch man. A frequent White House guest. You probably are aware of who are with me here today. Oh, by the way, my name's Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Tonight, world leaders and some of the biggest names in sports saying goodbye. Olympic sprinter Usain Bolt posting a sporting legend, rest in peace, King Pele. Soccer star Cristiano Ronaldo posting in part, he will never be forgotten and his memory will live on forever. And former President Obama writing, as one of the most recognizable athletes in the world, he understood the power of sports to bring people together. And whether you call it soccer or football, you know Pele was the king of the game. A court in army-ruled Myanmar found a deposed leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, guilty in all five counts of corruption. A source familiar to her trial said wrapping up the latest remaining cases against her. In a court session held behind closed doors, Suu Kyi, 77, was sentenced to a combined seven years in prison for the offences, said the source, who declined to be identified due to the sensitivity of the issue. A military spokesperson could not immediately be reached for comment. In the case that concluded on Friday, Aung San Suu Kyi was alleged to have abused her position and caused a loss of state funds by neglecting to follow financial regulations in granting permission to Win Myat A, a cabinet member in her former government, to hire, buy and maintain a helicopter. Aung San Suu Kyi was the de facto head of the government, holding the title of state councillor. Win Mint, who was the president in her government, was a co-defendant in the same case. The Nobel Peace Prize winner was also previously ordered to serve a total of 26 years in prison after being found guilty of a wide range of offences, all of which she has denied. 
A string of countries are now imposing new travel curbs as China is grappling with more infections taking over the nation. The latest country to order restrictions on travelers coming in from China is Italy, with the EU also on the verge of responding to China's latest easing of restrictions. Italy has ordered COVID-19 antigen swabs and virus sequencing for all travellers coming from China where the cases are surging. Italy, which was the first nation in Europe to be hit hard by the virus in February 2020 after it emerged in China, is now the first to impose mandatory tests on people arriving from the Asian country grappling with a new wave. During a news conference held in Rome, Italian Prime Minister Giorgio Meloni on Thursday said Italy expected and hoped that the European Union will follow its lead on imposing mandatory Covid tests for all passengers flying in from China. The main airport in the Italian city of Milan started testing passengers arriving from Beijing and Shanghai on December 26 and found that almost half of them were infected. In the same region, European Union health officials are holding talks as they attempt to coordinate a response to China's decision to lift its COVID-19 restrictions amid a wave of infections there, with Italy having mandated tests on arrival for all travellers by air from the country. The EU Health Security Committee's discussions comes as the scale of the outbreak in China and doubts over official data have prompted countries, including the United States, India, Taiwan and Japan, to impose new travel rules on Chinese visitors. In the EU, only Italy has done so, while others in the largely borderless bloc either said they saw no need to follow suit or were waiting for a common stance across the 27 member states. It was unclear when the committee's meeting would end and what decisions the body, which is composed of officials from health ministries across the bloc and chaired by European Commission, could take. China, on the other hand, is getting triggered with international nations responding to their latest decision in easing travel curbs. Chinese state media have slammed entry restrictions targeting travelers from China as discriminatory, with Malaysia and South Korea joining in to impose border control measures to tackling China's surge of COVID-19 infections. Chinese state media have hit out at countries imposing COVID-19 entry restrictions on arrivals from China, calling them discriminatory. State-run tabloid Global Times published an article late on Thursday that said, quote, The real intention is to sabotage China's three years of COVID-19 control efforts and attack the country's system. It comes as South Korea and Malaysia on Friday join the growing list of places to bring in new measures to tackle concerns over China's surge in COVID-19 infections. Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency Commissioner Ji Yong Mi told a news briefing tests will be required for all arrivals from the neighboring country, while short term visas will be restricted for Chinese nationals until the end of January. Beijing abruptly walked back at zero COVID policies in early December following an unprecedented flare up of public anger, leading to a wave of infections across the nation. Citing concerns over the scale of China's outbreak, doubt over its COVID statistics and fears over new variants emerging, countries such as the US, Italy and India have slapped entry restrictions on its inbound travellers. The situation doesn't seem to have dampened the spirits of Chinese citizens who have lived under harsh controls and not been able to leave the country for almost three years now. I haven't gone abroad to ski for such a long time. I'm a professional skier, so I really can't wait to be able to go abroad and ski again. But the world's second largest economy is expected to slow down further in the near term, as factory workers and shoppers fall ill. According to a Reuters poll on Friday, China's factory activity most likely cooled in December as rising infections began to affect production lines. India is under scrutiny as Uzbekistan's health ministry has said that 18 children have died after drinking a cough syrup manufactured by Indian drug maker Marian Biotech. The ministry said that preliminary tests showed a batch of medicine contained ethylene glycol, a toxic substance. The children were given the Doc 1 Max syrup without a doctor's prescription, it said. The amount they consumed also exceeded the standard dose for children. The allegation from Uzbekistan comes weeks after Gambia also linked child deaths to cough syrups made by another Indian firm. India's health ministry said in a statement that its officials have been in regular contact with the national drug regulator of Uzbekistan regarding the matter since 27 December. It added that health officials have conducted an inspection of Marion Biotech facility in Noida in Uttar Pradesh state. A legal representative of Marion Biotech said the Indian maker of pharmaceuticals and cosmetics has halted production of the cough syrup after the incident. Speaking to reporters outside the company's Noida facility, legal representative of Marion Biotech Hassan Harris said that the company regretted the deaths and has halted production 
production of the Doc 1 Max syrup. India's drug regulator said it has inspected Marion Biotech production facility in Noida and is in regular touch with its Uzbekistan counterpart, the Indian Health Ministry said in a statement. Benjamin Netanyahu was sworn in as Israeli Prime Minister for the sixth time, taking the helm of the coalition government that many analysts are calling the most right-wing in the country's history. A hard-right Israeli government was sworn in on Thursday, cementing Benjamin Netanyahu's comeback as Premier. The government aims to expand Jewish settlements in the occupied West Bank and pursue other policies that have stoked criticism at home and abroad. Since his bloc secured a parliamentary majority in a November election, Netanyahu, who is currently on trial for graft charges, has pledged to promote tolerance and pursue peace. But his allies include the religious Zionism and Jewish power parties, which oppose Palestinian statehood. Its leaders have previously agitated against Israel's justice system, its Arab minority and LGBT rights. Opponents heckled Netanyahu and some chanted, weak, weak. He listed his top priorities, including thwarting Iran's nuclear program, another a third mission to continue expanding the circle of peace with Arab states in order to end the Israeli-Arab conflict. For Palestinians, Netanyahu's lineup has darkened an already bleak outlook. After a year in which violence has surged across the West Bank, Jewish settlements are now set to expand over land on which Palestinians hope to build a future state. This is territory over which Netanyahu's party said the Jewish people have an exclusive and unassailable right. Most world powers deem building settlements on land captured in war illegal. Going into a short commercial break, we'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, Ukraine is still in the dark as residents of the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, were urged to head to their air raid shelters earlier today as sirens wailed across the city, a day after Russia carried out one of the biggest aerial assaults since it started the war in February. Russian rockets rained down on Kyiv on Thursday, the blasts shattering windows at this psychiatric hospital. No patients or staff were harmed, but for Dr. Nelia Kirnes, the attack was traumatic. She lost her home to an airstrike last February. Thursday's bombardment was fierce even by the standards of this conflict that has seen Russian forces pummel Ukrainian cities. Around 150 personnel and 468 patients were there at the time and remained indoors. Cyberblad said, thankfully, the psychiatric patients didn't panic. But for Kiernis, the attack was almost too much to bear. Russia denies deliberately targeting civilians. Ukraine's military said it had shot down 54 missiles out of 69 launched by Russia in the latest volley. Air raid sirens rang out across Ukraine for five hours in Kyiv. A meeting between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin via video conference took place today, with analysts watching for any sign of a softening in the Chinese leader's support for his Russian counterpart as the war in Ukraine drags on and as China faces an unprecedented outbreak of COVID-19. Russian President Vladimir Putin said he was expecting Chinese President Xi Jinping to make a state visit to Russia in spring 2023 in what would be a public show of solidarity from Beijing amid Russia's flailing military campaign in Ukraine. In introductory remarks from a video conference between the two leaders broadcast on state television, Putin said they were expecting their dear friend next spring on a state visit to Moscow. Putin said the visit would demonstrate to the world the closeness of Russian-Chinese relations. Speaking for around eight minutes, Putin said Russia-China relations were growing in importance as a stabilizing factor and that he aimed to deepen military cooperation between the two countries. In a response that lasted around quarter as long, she said China was ready to increase strategic cooperation with Russia against the backdrop of what he called a difficult situation in the world at large. The relationship between Russia and China, which the two sides have hailed as a no-limits partnership, has taken on great significance since Moscow sent its armed forces into Ukraine. Russian energy exports to China have risen significantly since the outbreak of the conflict, with Russia now China's single largest oil supplier. However, Beijing has so far been careful not to provide the sort of direct material support that could provoke Western sanctions against China. At a September summit in Uzbekistan, Putin acknowledged his Chinese counterpart's concerns about the situation in Ukraine. 
An attack in eastern Syria killed 10 oil field workers a day after Syrian Kurdish-led forces announced an offensive against ISIL. This comes following the deaths of six Kurdish fighters who were killed when IS fighters attacked the complex in Raqqa. The group's former a de facto capital in Syria in a bid to free fellow militants imprisoned there. The report said two others have been wounded in a terrorist attack that targeted three buses transporting workers from Al Taim oil feed in Deir ez Zor province. The report did not provide any information on the nature of the attack or who may be behind it, but a British based war monitor accused cells of the Islamic State group of carrying out the assault near the oil field. The attack began with explosive devices that went off as the buses drove by, then the group's militants shot at them, Rami Abdel Rahman, director of the Syrian Observatory of Human Rights, said. On Thursday, the Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces said they had begun an offensive against Islamic State fighters following an earlier assault on a prison in Raqqa, northwest of the attack on the bus. The SDF said the offensive aimed to eliminate IS fighters from areas that had been the source of the recent terrorist attacks. The operation is being carried out alongside the U.S.-backed coalition, although there were no immediate confirmations from the international force that they were taking part. The SDF statement said that in addition to the thwarted Raqqa attack, IS fighters had recently carried out eight assaults in the Deir Azzar area, Hasake and al Hol camp for displaced people, predominantly family members of IS members. After a meteoric rise in Iraq and Syria in 2014, IS saw its so-called caliphate collapse, but fighters remain and the group continues to claim attacks in the two countries. Now on an update on former Pope Benedict's health, the Vatican has said his condition remains grave but stable after Pope Francis said the former pontiff is very ill. The update comes a day after Pope Francis said his predecessor Benedict was very sick and asked people to pray so God would comfort him to the very end. The current Pope did not elaborate on Benedict's condition when he appealed for people to pray for him at the end of his general audience on Wednesday. The Vatican said after the service that the 95-year-old's condition had suddenly worsened due to age. A spokesman said he was receiving constant medical care and his condition was under control. Benedict became the first pope in some 600 years to resign in 2013 due to deteriorating health, with the former pontiff taking the title Pope Emeritus. He has been living in the Vatican and dedicating his life to prayer and medication, but has become increasingly frail in recent years. Australia is gearing up for the New Year's with celebrations prepared all across the continent. While usually peaceful, Sydney and Melbourne are putting on their best show in a friendly competition to determine which of the two have their best flair. Melbourne Lord Mayor Sally Capp says the city loves their friendly competition with Sydney for New Year's Eve fireworks. Ms Capp said that for Melbourne citizens, it's definitely about lighting up the city skyline. In a cheerful remark, she mentioned that the city is adding lasers this year. While they don't know if Sydney has got that, they're preparing for an epic showdown. The New Year's Eve celebrations in Sydney will begin with a smoking ceremony at 7.30pm before calling country fireworks display at 9.30pm, celebrating the local histories and contemporary experiences of Indigenous storytellers. The display is creatively directed by First Nations artist Carmen Glynn Brown and Dennis Golding from Rewrite Collective in partnership with Gadigal artist Nadina Dixon. A special three-minute lighting display will be held at 11 p.m. before pyrotechnic spectacular at the stroke of midnight. About 2,000 fireworks will be launched from the four sales of the Sydney Opera House, while 7,000 effects will fire from 184 positions on the Sydney Harbour Bridge and four rooftops around the city. Melbourne will ring in 2023 with two fireworks celebrations, a five-minute display at 9.30 p.m. and an eight-minute display at midnight. 30 CBD rooftops will be used to launch the firework displays. Four celebration zones will be set up in Docklands, Flagstaff Gardens, King Domain and Treasury Gardens. However, the City of Melbourne says the midnight fireworks display is designed to be viewed from afar and advises that skyline views from further away provide the best show. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. India cricketer Rishabh Pant is in stable condition in hospital following a car crash in early hours on Friday morning. Police said the wicketkeeper or batsman, who was alone in the car when it crashed in the northern state of Uttarakhand, had lost control of the vehicle when he dozed off. One of the most controversial internet celebrities, Andrew Tate, was recently arrested in Romania along with his brother Tristan Tate. The Tate brothers were allegedly arrested for human trafficking. Even though the fans are shocked after the arrest of Tate, this is not the first time Tate was arrested or accused of human trafficking.
Australia state of Queensland announced it will introduce new tougher penalties for youth crime after a British woman was killed in an alleged home invasion. Former Republican President Donald Trump's reduction tax returns will be made public. The Democratic Control Committee obtained the returns last month as part of an investigation into Trump's taxes after a lengthy court battle that ended with the U.S. Supreme Court ruling in the committee's favor. Peruvian president said that she will provide all necessary resources to prosecutors so they can investigate the more than two dozen deaths during protests that have rocked Peru following the ouster of her predecessor. And that's all from us from World News Tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Now, New York City is known as the city that never sleeps, but it's also known as the place to celebrate New Year's. With 2023 just around the corner, we leave you tonight with preparations being made for New Year's Eve. Have a great weekend and wish you all a very happy New Year. Stay safe and have a good night.